Thank you, thank you. I'm glad for being invited. Well, you see this mouthful of a title here, AI Learning Environments and PCG and Open-Endedness and the Extended Mind, which um, honestly was something I wrote about five minutes ago when I figured out that um, I needed a title. Um, that, but this is also sort of the declaration of content of this talk. Um, right. Uh, just a question of, I have about 40 minutes, right? Uh, 45. Uh, 45. Yeah. Uh, Forty-five minutes, uh, which is followed by 30 minute discussion. So it's kind of, yeah, you can, if, if you need to go a little bit over, I think it's fine, yeah. but there's a 30 minute. For, I, for don't, I don't think I will need to go over, but hey, famous last words. Anyway. So I'm Julian Tegelius. I work at New York University, and I'm also affiliated with the company Model AI, which is a game AI company in Denmark. Um, before we start, um, it's always nice to introduce myself. Who am I? Why am I here? Why are you listening to me? I can't answer the last one, but who am I? I can sort of listen. Um, I grew up in sunny Malmö in Sweden. It's not sunny. Um, and when, um, when I was there, I, um, I finished high school. Um, and I finished high school miraculously, despite um, that I almost failed my math classes because I hated math and was very bad at it. Um, so when I went to university, also in Sweden, I decided that, that I would definitely not study anything that had to do with math, not engineering or such things, because um, uh, I, I didn't like math and I didn't, um, um, and I wasn't good at it. So I wanted to, what I wanted to do was understand the mind. So I started studying philosophy and psychology. And unfortunately, um, my uh, restlessness got a better of me and I realized that I wasn't going to make any progress on understanding the mind anytime soon by simply talking about it or um, uh, looking at it and uh, um, from the outside, I need to build it. So I went to University of Sussex, um, where I did evolutionary and adaptive systems. And then after Sussex, I changed sex, I went to Essex. Um, and um, there I thought I was going to do um, a PhD on evolutionary robotics, using evolutionary algorithms to develop robot controllers. Um, and I started a little bit in that vein, and I realized that I was too impatient for that as well. So um, what I uh, what I realized that instead of instead of like robots, you could um, have many of the same problems in games. You could use games as your AI test beds in which you develop intelligence. So I did that, and somewhere along the line, I realized that there were lots of interesting AI problems in, in, in playing games, but there were also very many um, interesting problems in um, learning to generate games and learning to design games. Um, I worked for a bit with Jürgen Schmidhuber in at Ilse in Lugano, and I worked in a game um, a center for game science or yeah, game research in at the University of Copenhagen, and now I'm at New York University um, in the U.S., where I run the Game Innovation Lab. Um, I guess probably what I'm most known for is. Um, developing a lot of different methods for generating game content automatically or semi-automatically together with various humans. But I also um, have a very strong interest in general intelligence and um, a, I might have been known to be very critical about artificial general intelligence and its possibilities, partly because I don't think we have general intelligence. I mean, we humans. What I'm also somewhat well known for, and I think is the mainly the reason I'm here today, is that I've developed a whole bunch of different um, game-based um, AI benchmarks and AI environments. So taking games um, and creating ways of testing and developing environments which you can test and develop artificial intelligence methods in. I'll mention some of them today, though there's, there's a bunch more. <clears throat> So I do AI in games, um, both playing games and generating games and so on, but I'll also with a view to general intelligence. Right, that's it. Let's, let's get to something I have not talked about 100 times. Here's my hypothesis for today. 
development of AI agents is largely shaped and constrained by development of AI environments. What, I, what do I mean by shaped? Um, I think that um, if, we st if we take as a starting point that it isn't necessarily so that there is a, um, a kind of intelligence that is general, or even if there is one, um, I might admit that that might be possible. We, we are not developing any, anything close to it. So the particular kind of problems we're solving is extremely much shaped by the particular um, tasks we're setting ourselves, which are um, a very much um, shaped by the environments we use to, um, to train them. And, and to train them and test them and demonstrate our algorithms in, more so than the algorithms themselves. Um, from this perspective, you can see the history of artificial intelligence as a history of environments rather than as history of, of algorithms. Though the algorithms get all the press, really I think much of the in, in, in innovation is in setting the new environments. With environments, I'm talking about chess and checkers, dominating AI research a long time ago, as well as like the largely constructed environments of Shaky the Robot or Blocks World um, and so on. Um, and later on, we're talking about um, we're talking about like simple arcade games. Oh, we're talking about Go, of course. We're talking about more complex games like StarCraft and so on. And this basically shapes what what we're developing. And in order to make progress towards more general intelligence, or at least types of intelligence, types of cognitive problem solving we haven't done before, we need to advance environments. So the classic view, which we will challenge um, within the next 40 minutes, is this. You have an environment, the environment um, takes actions, or the environment receives actions from the agent, and it gives back state and reward to the agent. Um, uh, and with slight variations, um, this is what people tend to think of the agent and the environment. Yet, in order to get published at AAAI or NeurIPS or HK or something like this, you basically, I mean, 95% 95, 95 of everything really focuses on these little agent box here. And I think that's um, unfair, <laughs> or at least non-productive. So let's move into this um, green cloud here first. First point I wanna make um, is about the poverty of arcade games. The screenshot here, here is, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie um, or the documentary, The King of Kong. Um, if you haven't, I recommend that you watch it. It's about um, uh, the world champion of Donkey Kong and um, the uh, machinations behind um, an arcade game champion. Um, he turns out um, not to be such a great guy in every situation. It's, um, it's very fascinating. Um, it's fascinating because um, it tells the tale of an obsession with an extremely well-defined and well-circumscribed task, such as playing Donkey Kong, um, and how that, how the master of this task might map very, very badly onto, uh, well, not at all, onto the rest of life. Which actually brings us to a point, because we've had literally thousands of papers published um, in the, well, in the last half decade or in the, in the last decade about playing arcade games. Of course, this didn't start with DeepMind in 2015. Um, it started in the, in the early 2000s. Um, the, um, uh, even though we were not playing for pixels, um, back in 2005 um, with the launch of the Computation Intelligence Games and Artificial Intelligence Interactive Digital Entertainment Conferences, we saw a lot of work on various types of AF playing arcade games. They are, um, they are uh, defined by having well-defined tasks, or they characterized by having well-defined tasks, limited episode lengths, a single perspective, typically you're always looking at the world and environment from the same perspective, maybe it's the same screen, maybe it changes. Limited action set, um, for example, you know, the Atari controller had um, eight directions you could move and one button and sure you can with some trickery make that button represent multiple actions but um not that many and a static world um 
to a large extent, you are the only thing that's happening. Um, your agent moving is, is the thing that's happening in the world and everything else sort of depends on that. Um, and these, um, uh, these sort of limitations are uh, where they come from is very clear when you look at A, how simple, how limited game design was back in the early 80s and late 70s. Also how limited the hardware was, which is like extremely limited. The Commodore 64 is 64 kilobytes of memory, and the Atari 2600 had, what is it, 128 bytes of memory, um, and no video memory, so on, um, yeah. Um, so what do we get from learning to play an arcade game? Um, we get um, something which is as simple as, as this. So um, uh, to sort of cut to the chase here, um, policies trained on arcade games don't generalize to other tasks, other games, or even other levels. Um, and you could wonder if what we're doing um, with all this experimentation, all these like GPU hours and human hours have been um, uh, Put, um, poured into a training mostly deep neural networks to play arcade games if we are simply um, learning some kind of fancy lookup tables. If in this action do that, if in, the, if in this position do that. There's a number of papers that um, uh, sort of build towards, uh, build evidence towards this view, um, which I hold pretty strongly. Um, um, uh, uh, some of them are cited here. There's open AI work in trying to quantify generalization and reinforcement learning. Um, um, uh, there's a work for Benjus Group, so no fitting. We did some work where we tried to train um, uh, agents on individual levels in this general video game AI framework, which is similar to early 80s arcade games and very much inspired by it. And we found that um, in general, they were extremely, uh, they were extremely um, constrained to the particular problem um, they were trained on. Not only did they not learn to play other games, they could not learn other um, uh, um, other level to play other levels of the same game. So it's 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 a disgrace, really. Um, why are we spending so much time doing this? Uh, what we do, what we're seeing is a kind of overfitting. Um, uh, maybe one thing I'd go back in. Another thing we we managed to find in another recent paper is that you can train um, a, a neural network. If you change the representation of many of these Atari games, you can train a network with literally six neurons. So um, a few hundred sort of uh, um, synaptic weights um, to play these games fairly well. If you just change the representation um, and, and capture static images and uh, um, use the similarity to these images as inputs to the network. So what we're seeing happening is a kind of overfitting. Um, <clears throat> we're learning not to, well, this is an hypothesis. The previous, the, the empirical phenomenon of, learn, of we're not learning general policies is clear. Um, main hypothesis we have is overfitting. Um, we're fitting data too well. We are simply learning some kind of lookup table, much like overfitting is supervised learning, but in this case, with reinforcement learning. I'm open to other ideas about what exactly is happening, but this is, I think, a pretty strong hypothesis. Um, so what can we do to get, to get um, um, beyond that? One thing is to introduce environmental variation. As you know from the Atari 2600, it had like, the games had a very, very strict sequence. You had levels which you played in order. And also because the Atari 2600 is absolutely horrible to program for, um, uh, you can't really change these games um, easily. So in other game de and development, there is a tradition of creating games with, um, um, with, um, um, with various kinds of variations. So it's called procedural content generation, um, where you um, create some aspect of the game as it goes along. Um, so we have um, classic games like um, Elite here in the, oh, my mouse pointer is working. Elite here is a game um, which was sort of the predecessor of No Man's Sky, which is another game that builds very heavily on procedural content generation. It came out in the early 80s. Um, you could travel between star systems and um, you could um, um, engage in space piracy. You could um, uh, 
and do missions, you could trade goods, you could um, um, do all kinds of things. And it had like thousands of star systems um, in 64K memory on a Commodore 64, which is because every time you visit a star system, it was constructed from a random seed. Um, you have other games like the games in the Civilization series here. Every time you start playing them, they have a completely fresh world, and that's sort of the main appeal of these games. Um, uh, and uh, Spelunky, which is um, a similar thing, it's a sort of um, puzzly platformer where every time you play it, you have a completely new set of levels, though the themes of the levels are the same. Um, I've worked a lot on various ways of doing procedural content generation games. Here's a book we wrote about it. It's also part of another recent book. Um, uh, and the, the idea that we can use these methods to create the kind of more variable challenges which spur um, the learning of more general policies is pretty obvious. Of course we should do this, right? Um, so let me tell you a tale. Um, uh, what I'm going to show you now, this is terrible resolution, I don't know why. Um, these are screenshots from several games in the general video game playing competition and the general video game AI framework. We built this framework um, so that um, we could create a competition where the idea was that every time you, um, you, you had a common interface to a number of games, there's now uh, more than 160 games in this framework. Um, these games are all uh, based on, a, based on or inspired by late 70s, early 80s games. Some of them are inspired by more recent indie games. Um, we built this sort of this infrastructure so that you can build agents and then you can submit them to this competition and um, have them play games you have never seen before. And we ran this for about six years. Uh, and the main track of the competition is currently suspended because no one has the time to put into making new games. But the, the great thing here is that you can, you can test exactly the same agent on a number of different games. And while the competition was running, you could, you could basically submit your agents and have them to, and test it on games you had never seen because no one except the creators had seen them before. Which um, is a much more reasonable way of testing any kind of AI capacity of your agents compared to training on Donkey Kong and then playing Donkey Kong, for example, because that is by definition testing on a training set. So you submit controllers in a planning track, you can use a forward model. Um, in the learning track, you have no forward model, but you get training, you get learning time. Um, and we create a language called a video game description language. This is a description of a game. Um, uh, where at the top you see what's, what's involved in, um, uh, well, the description language describes at the top here what's, what exists in the game, what are the sprites, there's a goal and um, this door, um, uh, and, and key is a type of immovable and certain colors and certain image. You have a mapping that goes from um, the um, level description here. Every game description can have multiple levels, typically they have at least five. Um, to the ontology of the game. And then you have the core rules of the game. What happens when various things collide? Um, these are not the only rules, but these are the key rules. So for example, if anything moves, collides with a wall, you stop. Um, and if the enemy collides with a sword, then the enemy dies, you get two points and so on. And if um, you die, you lose. If you get to the exit, you win. And that's how it's defined. So it was for maximum sort of, you know, flexibility. You can change both the rules and the levels very easily on the fly by a human or by a machine. Here is an example of a human playing um, um, a version of the overworld of Legend of Zelda or something inspired by it. Get the key, kill the monsters, get to the door. Very nice. Um, these are not trivial. Here's a random agent playing this. The random agent takes random actions. Not surprisingly, the random agent loses. Here is um, an Expectimex open loop tree search. What you can think of it as something like MCTS. So I'm going to call it tree search. It is searching ahead, um, killing the monster, so you see finding the key. Now um, the rollups don't, don't yet really reach the door, but now they did. Okay, you can win. Great. Here is um, the very same agent, exactly the same lines of code, no retraining, nothing. 
um, playing a version of Space Invaders, um, which is perhaps not the most interesting or in, in the interesting game there is, but you know, if you don't, you, you will still die if you don't play it well. Um, we see that this agent seems to take irrational actions, but it's very, um, um, very good at figuring out um, when to shoot, simply. And again, um, an agent playing Space Invaders is not interesting, but the very, very same agent playing any of these games is interesting. Here is um, a game based on the classic old game Boulder Dash. It has both puzzle elements. You need to um, realize how you sort of um, uh, don't dig yourself in the corner. You need to collect these diamonds and then get to the door and not get killed by these enemies. Um, in this case, the MCTS agent um, was killed by the enemies. Um, I think the best existing agent reliably solves um, any levels of less than half of the games. So we have many games in here which are hard, even for agents that do get a forward model. Um, and when you look at agents that try to use reinforcement learning, it's extremely hard. So these are hard challenges. Um, so we did some experiments here in using standard deep reinforcement learning methods. In this case, uh, the advantage actor critic um, and not having a forward model, learning to play these games. Um, and a um, standard sort of um, deep network architecture that you often use in, um, in learning to play arcade games. And what you see here, oh yeah, there, there we go. We have, an, this is an agent, sorry for the bad resolution, um, that has been trained on this particular level. And this is the same thing in loop again and again, and learns to solve this level and does really well. Nice. Um, problem is, well, the problem is if you take this agent um, and uh, and test it on any other level, it doesn't do it. It doesn't play a solve at all. It has not learned anything general at all beyond the topology of this level and what needs to be done to play that to play this level successfully. So we built level generators for a number of different games here, um, including the Zelda game you saw. Um, and the Bondage game, and uh, Frogs is a version of Frogers, and they provide endless supplies of levels. They're fairly simple um, level generators, um, um, and uh, they use um, standard methods, and the levels are produced sort of um, medium difficulty, but we, we introduce a difficulty gauge, so you can basically increase the difficulty. And you see here, basically, these are generated levels. At the top here, Solar Fox. Um, it's a very simple level with um, no enemies. You can simply pick up um, these diamonds and you're done. And then you get more complicated patterns of um, things you need to pick up and, uh, and more enemies. And here for the Zelda, the um, uh, levels get progressively more complicated in terms of number of enemies and walls that are in your way as you increase difficulty. Um, and the same thing for Frogger and Bob Dash here. So the idea here was that what if you train these agents on not one level, but an endless stream of levels, and you start extremely simply, but, um, but as you sort of go along, it gets harder and harder and harder. And we thought this would work, um, and it works to an extent. Here is um, an agent that has been um, uh, trained on, um, okay, well, this is, oh, this is an example of what does not work. Okay, so we see here is a level that's almost ridiculously simple. It's always a set of levels. That basically you have a three by three grid with a goal and a key in. And honestly, you would play, you would solve this fast within a second by just mashing the keyboard. And yet, agents trained to play this level one, they are actually considerably worse than random. Um, so basically, this, this really points to the need for um, forcing, genera uh, forcing variation as you train. Um, and what we saw here was that um, on these different games, if you sort of gradually increased the difficulty level here, as the agents got better, um, you got this nice thing where you saw like performance, which is then averaged over all the different um, um, levels, um, the games that played at a particular generation, um, 
they tend to get better and better and better. So these are between one and this is 10 million steps, I think here, um, the time steps in the game. Um, and it, we can to some extent force it to learn more general things through this, what we call progressive procedural content generation. Um, um, <clears throat> so you sort of, you keep generating levels and you gradually increase the difficulty. However- Julian, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah I hear nothing. Muted. On, <laughs> on, sorry, on the previ previous slide, you have the, um, the performance on the level one. Um, can you explain, so what was it trained on? Was it trained on the same, same level and then? No, 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 no. So, so, so that, that slide was, it was trained on level one, a single fixed level and tested on an endless sequence of generated mm -hmm. extremely simple levels. And that was mainly to show how bad it was. <laughs> but even, even so if it was the, um, the, the training, the training level was the bigger level one that we saw yes. earlier. Yes. And the was, okay. Yeah. Thank and you. If, you tra if, if you train it on an endless sequence of these very simple levels, it actually learns to solve them. We get this is endless, yeah. So it actually quickly goes up here in, in difficulty. The problem is it never, even after many millions of training steps, it never learns to solve um, um, levels of any difficulty reliably. It never goes above like 0 0.5 here. And it's much worse, for example, for the boulder dash, it never learns to solve anything beyond the most trivial levels reliably. It's just refusing to learn anything general. And this is using the same methods um, as our, um, I mean, the, the reinforcement learning algorithm here um, is the same um, as, as you see used all the time. This is like straight from OpenAI's code. I would, venture to say that deep reinforcement learning on these kind of Atari games is basically a lie. It's not working. We can't learn to play them. We can learn very specific sequences and look at tables, essentially. Um, and I think that um, uh, hopefully we will get to the realization that this is a blind alley, we should stop doing this. Um, I will be part of um, developing a couple of other um, more recent benchmarks in the past that have done on, um, a number of things, basic car racing, super and so on. This is one which is very nice. This is Obstacle Tower um, by a team of Unity with the help of me and Ahmed Khalifa, one of my PhD students, um, recently graduated. It's a complex 3D game. It's a sort of a puzzle platformer. Um, and the nice thing, it, it has a number of different um, sources of variation. Um, including the different visual styles, but also um, the this is what um, the part that we did in this is the floor generation. So as you get as you ascend this tower, this is floor four, this is floor ten, this is floor twenty-two. As you ascend this tower, um, you get increasingly complex um, um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, the floor floor layouts. And it's not just not how the rooms are connected, it's the individual puzzles that you need to solve in each of these rooms. This obstacle tower is so far very much unsolved. And so what it looks like is that the best, um, uh, the, the best um, techniques for this involve a significant amount of human demonstration, but also like um, um, various policy gradient methods. Bomberman, um, this is a version, this is a partially observable Bomberman. Um, and uh, I had a little bit of a hand in this, and in particular in ideas for how it should be procedurally generated. Um, nice thing is that, that every time you play out a match, which is between four different players, um, you have a completely new map you need to adapt to. Yet, you may start wondering, what are we learning really from learning to play these very simple games? It's even if we manage to sort of somehow um, learn to play well in the face of variation. Are we learning any, anything beyond a very, very trivial skill here? So, yeah, in other words, where's the learning ceiling? What's the sort of, um, even if we did this well, what have we learned? Is it, is, is it time we go to something more complicated? Um, so there has, it, I think it has been advanced several times that um, you could use open world environments. So, Games or other environments would agent has more freedom 
you can move around with more relative freedom. Um, and you um, can take many possible actions. Um, because at any point you can choose from a large number of them. And you have a complex and or self-directed goal structure. When I'm talking about these things like this, I'm talking about like um, Skyrim, which um, is um, a beautiful, um, a huge open world role playing game where you basically decide what you're doing completely on your own and you go explore the world and you can be like um, a, you can be um, a, um, a smith or you can be a dragon hunter or you can be a thief or, you know, there is a main quest, but you don't have to do it. Or things like Dwarf Fortress here, which um, has an intentionally off-putting interface. No, nothing like the beautiful graphics of Skyrim, <laughs> um, but it's a very complex simulation game where um, you, um, uh, well, there is a world with a fortress with dwarves in it, and you control them and make them do things, but um, as yet the world sort of, um, 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 as, as the world intentionally, uh, as, as, as the world spir descends into craziness. Um, and uh, uh, it's simulated down to the level where you can have different socks on the different feet of each one of your dwarfs, but it also has like geological scale events. Um, it's very fascinating and, and almost unplayable. Or things like Grand Theft Auto games, um, which have actually been used to ASAP benchmarks a bit. These are all sort of agentic games where you have an agent where you play around, and it gets weirder. You have things like Animal Crossing, um, where you basically we do control an agent, but you, there is no killing and there is no sort of, there's, there's little in the way of actual quests. Um, you're basically um, um, building a holiday village and having fun with your neighbors. Um, same city where you're um, creating a city and um, you can't really win because there's no objective. Minecraft, which is done in very many different ways, um, uh, uh, you, it's largely about setting your own challenges or Factorio, where you build factories. So all these things, um, they point to like, what you see is like a very drastically relevant vision for AI environments and AI benchmarks. So are these the next big thing? Um, you know, we've, we, we managed to conquer these complex games and now we're playing Animal Crossing and trying to figure out, um, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out how to plant petunias and have fun with our neighbors. Well, actually, from many perspectives, these games are terrible benchmarks in, in many ways. So you have, they're very hard to play. This is civilization, very open-ended. Um, you know, we talk about how chess has a branch effector of 35 and um, Go has a branch effector of like 350, and that's why Go was harder than chess. Now, what's the branching factor of civilization? Let's imagine you have 10 units um, and each that you can move it in a given turn, and each of them can, can move to one of 10 different positions. Now, this is a very small early stage civilization game, but let's imagine that. Well, then you have 10 to the power of 10 different actions um, to choose from, which is like completely unreasonable. Um, you have the idea of perspective, um, because instead of these sort of fixed perspectives, these uh, simple arcade games, you have a lot going on, different screens and different, like in many ways, some of these games are more like office applications than, than there are like early arcade games. There's a lot of navigation. There's a lot of creating mental models of what goes on in the world from these different perspectives. Um, you have tasks. These different games, different approaches to this. Uh, at the top here, you have the task, you have the quest list from Skyrim, from someone who's probably have, you know, somewhere in the mid game. And also each of these are like, you know, main quests and then they're like, you know, steps in these main, or big quests here and, and, and steps in these quests. It's like an extreme, it's extreme amount of different um, and rewards, you, know, so you, you can say. Um, but then there also, you can, you can play the game this way. This is a chicken factory in Minecraft. <laughs> so what is a chicken factory? Well, someone, well, many people did um, after someone first figured out you could do it, um, uh, built a factory that breeds chickens from eggs um, 
and then automatically um, uh, slaughters them and cleans them and creates food um, and creates like edible food from them. So you basically, it's like a, it's like a production line. Um, uh, this is a fascinating thing to build in Minecraft. Why did someone build this in Minecraft? Because there was no quest to build a chicken factory. I'm pretty sure that the makers of the game wouldn't want to quest we build a chicken factory. Um, it's just someone decided to do it because, because you can. So this is how these games are. Trying to shoehorn these into a classic environment agent um, structure and a classic reinforcement learning framework is uh, pretty pointless, isn't it? Um, so, um, yeah, what can you say? So there's, there, there's been several competitions based on Minecraft, um, including um, one, there's a second edition of Minecraft reinforcement learning competition. It's all great, it's nice. Another reinforcement learning competition is nice. But really, that's sort of beside the point of what Minecraft is. Maybe Minecraft is actually a pretty great AI environment in different ways, <clears throat> but um, not if we try to sort of fit it into this sort of reinforcement learning setting. Okay, let's change tack. Let's go to um, another interesting idea here. So this is an idea that I've been thinking about since the first way this paper. 15 or more ago, years ago. Well, I forgot about it, but I was thinking about it again. This is The Extended Mind. It's a paper by um, the philosophers Andy Clark and David Shanks, um, where they basically propose the theory that um, cognition and mind is not something that just happens in the brain, or not even something that just happens in the body. So the mind extends into everything we use. Tools we use for cognition, language, notebooks, measuring sticks, computers, other people. Um, they take um, um, an example of, um, I forgot the names of the people, two, two people who um, both decide that they want to go to the Museum of Modern Art to see an exhibition. One of them remembers that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street, but the other has a light version of Alzheimer's and he writes everything down and he consults his notebook to figure out that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street. Both of them act <clears throat> as if um, um, they believe that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street. Um, but the first person, for the first person that knowledge is in the head, the second person that knowledge is in the notebook. And they argue that there's no reason why you would, um, uh, why you would say that um, the knowledge is in the notebook is not mind in the same way as knowledge is in the brain is. So you take this thesis seriously. <clears throat> you think something that the cognition is dependent on and not only dependent on partly constituted by our environment, um, maybe also our consciousness is. So that's even more, that's sort of more um, um, com um, complex. So um, more contentious. Um, so taking this seriously, you have to start questioning this whole idea of an agent and an environment, because if you're really interested in developing intelligence, much of it is in the environment, like, not like metaphorically, but literally the cognition largely is an environment. And what we have done is create an environment that helps us do cognition, because the environment we interact with is largely created by us. Um, I think it is, uh, I myself like to think of it this way, um, uh, that we feel intelligence, we humans, we feel that we have some kind of general intelligence because we created a world, like look at our civilization, I'm just looking out of Manhattan right here, but you know, well, wherever you are, you're in some kind of civilization. I know that because you're using Zoom um, and you have Wi-Fi. But you have like, you're basically in a human created environment where you build environment and your language and your technology and so on that is built to make you feel intelligent because that's how we do things. Here's another exa example of the extended mind. Um, it's, um, I like bringing this up because everybody's played Tetris. Um, I, mean, uh, I mean, even if you lived under a rock um, for uh, 30 years, you, you still play Tetris. Under a rock is a great place to play Tetris. Um, but in Tetris, you're guiding these falling rocks 
down, these tetrominoes down. And as you, as you're watching this view, I know that you are trying to rotate this yellow piece in your head to see how it would fit. Now it turns out that when people play Tetris, almost everyone does a lot more rotations than they need. Why do they do that? Because in many cases, it's much faster to rotate the piece on the screen than it is in your head. Um, and, um, and what Clark and Sharma says is that this is a great case of set of mind. Your cognition actually extends into the game. You are thinking with the game. It's part of your thinking as you're trying to figure out where to put this um, piece. Um, right, so if you take this seriously, which I think we should, what does this mean for AI environments? So, I don't know really. I'm throwing a couple of things out here. I'm looking forward to disagreement. Um, I think we want environments that can form part of mind. Um, this is sort of the opposite of the static environments we see in our game. Ethology, uh, like where you see a thing and this is like a possibility to act. We want a form of a composite behavior, not doing just a single thing, but doing many things in sequence to create something more complex. We want the build, ability to build new mind mechanisms out of the environment. I think this um, example with um, the um, chicken factory in Minecraft is actually pretty, pretty apt here. Um, maybe we want learnable or programmable, programmable features in the environment in some way. Um, because, right, if we take this seriously that the environment is as much mind as the agent is, then we maybe should have other parts of the environment be learnable. Which is like definitely true for any kind of animal acting in a natural environment, because the environment is largely constituted by other um, animals. So if you go back to open world games, um, many open world games and open-ended games feature ways of changing the world. Um, and in many cases, some of these, what makes these case, games more interesting is that the line between playing the game and creating content for the game is blurred. So it's in City again, you're creating a world. And here is um, Legend of Zelda uh, Breath of the Wild, where in um, part of the game where you're cooking and you cook, you're collecting things and you're creating these potions and foods that you can use in different ways. By the way, like many of my presentations, my real goal isn't, want, isn't to make you um, uh, um, think about science. It's about wanting to make you play games. You know, you see the screenshots, you will want to play games. No, but anyway, that's one of them. So you can say that only creative play is really open-ended. The really interesting challenges um, come from, in this kind of games and environments, come from agents creating their own environments and defining their own challenges. Here is SimCity being played, not by a human, but by an, an agent. This is um, uh, my work from my incoming PhD student, Sam Earl, where he trained fractal neural networks to play SimCity in order to maximize, um, a, like, um, um, uh, it maximize various features like population size and, um, uh, and score and so on. And as you can see, this looks like an extremely badly planned city and everything is highway. Um, and I think he's trying to build Los Angeles um, or something like that. Um, here is basically the same method being used to create game levels. Um, and I bring this up um, because I'm an academic and a self shameless self-promotion. Look, no, it's not shameless. Academics have no shame. But, um, but the interesting thing is in one case, the very same method is being used to play a game. In another case, to create game content. It's actually the same thing. We have a competition in Minecraft also as well, um, which is called the Generative Design in Minecraft Settlement Generation Competition. This is about creating Minecraft building agents that get um, an environment, where they get like, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, well, 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 they get a piece of landscape and then you come up with, um, and the submitted agent needs to build a settlement that fits on this one. This, what you see here, is not uh, in anything built by any of the competition entries. far too good for that. It's like a large team of humans building a complicated Minecraft settlement of a long time. Um, this is clearly not the general AI challenge, but it's an interesting challenge because it's so different from the typical game playing challenges. We have a team of humans. Um, judging best competition address here. 
Okay, we've gotten to the end of this. Um, and um, there, I hope you could perceive the thread and the argument made to these some, sometimes somewhat disparate parts. What I'm thinking, if we take the, uh, the extended mind um, idea seriously and want to create the kind of um, environments that would enable the um, emergence of different kinds and hopefully in many ways more general intelligence than what we've seen so far, we need to create new environments. My proposal here is to create an environment which is very open-ended, but still includes a large number of elemental rewards and punishments, things you can eat that will give you some sort of bonus or some sort of you know, energy or things that hurt you and so on. Um, it should definitely be something with a fast forward model so you could explore using both planning algorithms and um, a, a planning algorithms and using um, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms and other kinds of learning algorithms that don't rely on a forward model, um, uh, and which disqualifies basically all standard game engines uh, because they don't do the fast forward models. Um, two dimensional or and three dimensional views or both. Um, it's not not really important unless you have visual input, but uh, it could be good with multiple views. This is basically saying don't base this library don't base it on existing game because um, they have too many limitations in technically. Um, importantly, composition elements that the agent can learn to restructure, recombine, so that the agent can build things out of out of things, be it similar to chemistry be it Lego bricks, be it something Minecraft-ish or something. And potentially, and this is like, maybe this coming out of, uh, out of nowhere, this is like based on an old idea I've been throwing around with Sebastian Riese at IDU Copenhagen for ages, um, but we never got around to doing. Having an external force that drive complexification of environment by uh, sort of continually injecting either new types of um, things in the world or new rules to the world like you're complexifying it by like ah well you okay you can master this world but actually now the green and the blue things um, can't touch each other and bounce away from each other or like now suddenly we open up this molecular level where um, where, where, where the molecules bind in complicated ways and, and suddenly there is more things you can do with the world and there are more complex worlds in, in, in which what um, in which the world, uh, ways in which the world gives you feedback. I think my time is up. I'm sure my time is up. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much.